I had a farm in Africa. These words, spoken by Meryl Streep, deep velvet voice, still resonate in the ears of those who loved Out of Africa, the movie that unveiled the African continent to a wide Western audience, as it was and will never be again. I had a farm in Africa is the opening line of Karen Blixen's book from which the film is adapted. Karen, Tanne, Tanya, Isaac Dinesen. Many names for a woman who had many lives. The one spent in Africa was certainly the most intense, probably the most painful. Karen left Denmark for Africa at the age of 28 to marry Swedish Baron Bror von Blixen Fineke and become a Baroness. But above all, to escape the agony of a gloomy, rigid and pious family. She found the freedom she was looking for, but at a very high price. This is a story of a house that became a symbol of an entire continent. It's a story about lions, lionesses and the risk of living without fearing death. After less than a year of marriage, her husband infected her with syphilis which would cause her excruciating pain throughout her life, force her into long hospital stays and prevent her from having children. Additionally, Broer bought a coffee plantation with her family's money. Located not far from Nairobi, at the foot of Ngong Hills, the place was beautiful, but the purchase ill-fated. The altitude and soil were not suitable for coffee. The plants didn't grow. The leaves turned yellow and died, bearing very little fruit. Soon, the marriage collapsed and Bro left home. Karen found herself managing the plantation alone. She was a woman on her own in Africa in 1918. Mbogani House, the house in the woods, as the Africans called it, was a house loved and defended with fierce tenacity and against all logic. It was a lively house full of people and animals, guests, servants, the famed totos, the African boys who helped Karen with various tasks, from cooking to looking after the dogs. The priceless Farah, the Somali servant, noble, elegant, faithful, who would become a sort of confidant. There were pets and wild animals alike, the beloved dogs Dusk and Banya, or the fawn Lulu, saved and raised in the house. Karen went to Africa to escape her family. In the boundless African plains, while hunting or on safaris, she did find freedom. But true freedom, the meaning and essence of her life, she found within the walls of this house, where she became herself. She often hosted guests. Her kitchen became famous throughout Kenya, which was still called British East Africa and was under British protectorate, and famous were her bouquet of flowers, freshly picked from her garden. Bogani House became a magnet, attracting both drifters and notable personalities. The porch, the lawn, or the mahogany panels of the dining room saw the likes of the Prince of Wales, tribal chiefs such as Kinanjui, the proud and respected Kikuyu leader, as well as down-on-the-luck actors, bankrupt fugitives, murderers, clandestine lovers, an Indian mystic, and an endless line of indigenous men, women and children seeking her medical care. Karen had time and attention for everyone, but there was one special guest. Dennis Finch Hatton. In the movie, he's played by a captivating Robert Redford, but it seems that the real Dennis was no less. A living legend, apparently. Karen considered him so precious that she barely mentions him in Out of Africa. 
aristocratic, fearless, cultured. He embodied gallantry, the highest human expression, according to Karen. There are so few people who can lift life out of the mundane run and give it poetry, she would say of him. In a wild place, where the mail arrived once a month, meat was eaten only when hunted, books were rare and therefore sacred, even more rare and sacred, was a good conversation. Dennis, who was equally at ease among the Maasai of the African savanna as among Eton and Oxford alumni, in the mud of the Maniatas as well as above the clouds, once he became an airplane pilot, immediately seemed like a demigod to her. And like all gods, he was elusive. In 1923, Dennis moved into this room, but he never truly lived here. Between safaris, he would spend a few weeks a year, but those few days were enough to repay Karen for all the hardships that plagued her. Droughts, locusts, diseases, the collapse of coffee price and the ever worsening plantation. Karen and Dennis would light the fireplace, drink champagne, smoke opium, listen to Schubert, and she would tell him tales. Thus, she honed the art of storytelling, which would make her famous later on. Houses, like dogs, often mirror their owners. Simple, cozy, practical, Mbogani embodied Karen and her contradictions. Her bedroom, for instance, wouldn't be out of place in a modest and respectable house in Denmark. Everything she wanted to escape from. Come now, let us go and risk our entirely worthless lives, she said defiantly to Dennis in front of a lion. They were at the height of their love story. It is the climax of the book. Karen learned this courage in Africa, but she would only fully practice it when she was forced to leave the continent, when fate had taken everything from her. Because, as she loved to say, he lives free only who can face death. The lion is still here, a bit scruffy perhaps. After all, it's almost 100 years old. When in 1931, her brother Thomas saw her climbing down the steamer that brought her back to Denmark after nearly 20 years, he was shocked. Karen was the shadow of the woman she used to be. Pale, emaciated, she had lost 15 kilos. In truth, she had lost everything she loved. Her house, her farm, its inhabitants, and Dennis Finch Hatton, who had died in a plane crash days before she left. Because, as she used to say, disasters in Africa never occur one at a time. Karen never returned to Africa. She started another life in Denmark, in another house, that would be the object of a next zigzag episode. Although, as she wrote, I have a feeling that wherever I may be in the future, I will always be wondering whether there is rain at Mouvan. Mm -hmm.